Hello and welcome to the second in a webinar series sponsored by American Institutes for Research, or AIR, on topics of relevance to the vocational rehabilitation community. My name is Dahlia Shaywitz. I'm a principal researcher at AIR, and I'm pleased to introduce today's webinar on survey planning and administration. Today's webinar will give us an overview of the process and planning that goes into conducting a survey and the tools and resources you will need, whether you are creating and administering a survey at the agency level or overseeing the work of a vendor. The webinar will help you understand the steps in the process, and we will ask you to share your experiences with surveys as well. Before we begin, I would like to introduce you to our presenters, Mark Masterton, a senior researcher at AIR, and Pia Peltola, a principal researcher at AIR. Both Mark and Pia work within our Center for Survey Methods. The Center for Survey Methods at AIR supports the design, collection, analysis of surveys conducted by federal st and state governments, private firms, universities, institutes, and nonprofit organizations across the country. The center has a team with a range of survey skills, and the team includes survey methodologists, sampling statisticians, psychometricians, application and database developers, and statisticians with experience in a variety of social and behavioral science fields. Those of you who are involved with the Mandatory Comprehensive Statewide Needs Assessment as part of your work know that the needs assessment typically consists of collecting data using different methods such as interviews, observations, focus groups, and surveys. In this webinar, we will focus on surveys and some of the best practices in conducting survey studies and analyzing the resultant data. We'll discuss the main issues you should keep in mind when you are planning a survey and creating the survey instrument, the questionnaire. We will also discuss different data collection methods and their advantages and disadvantages. Finally, we will discuss how to calculate and ma maximize response rates. Now I'll turn it over to Mark. At the end of this hour, you'll have a better understanding of how surveys can be useful for various purposes, such as evaluating programs, how to design a survey study, including choosing an appropriate data collection method or methods, and how to calculate and describe response rates for the survey. But before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to discuss why surveys matter. Besides fulfilling the requirements of the VR agency, why is it important that your agency conduct surveys and collect data from VR employees, and customers, your various partners, and other stakeholders? If you could, please use the chat function on the upper right hand side of your screen and send me some reasons for why surveys are important. How can your agency use survey data? How about VR consumers? How can survey data benefit them? Or any other reasons why surveys can be useful for your work? Other reasons could be that it provides agencies feedback on how well they're doing their work, how to improve services, which is related to what Barry said, or how new initiatives are working, and help agencies increase the number of businesses to provide employment for people with disabilities. You could discover new services that might be needed in a particular region, or it could provide evidence to support increased funding and how, it's, how it should be allocated. All those reasons, and the ones you all provided, point to the fact that surveys are important. Because survey data can empower entities like federal and state governments, and local agencies and programs, companies, political groups to create plans and policies and use survey data to support their positions and help create change. For example, the federal government uses the American Community Survey, or ACS, which is the former long form of the U.S. decennial census for various planning purposes. One of the questions on the ACS is, when did this person serve on active duty in the United States Armed Forces? The results of this question are used to establish somebody's veteran status and to plan veteran services appropriately in different parts of the country. The ACS also has four questions to measure physical, mental, or emotional disability status. Data from these four questions is also used to appropriate funds and plan services for people with disabilities. Although not comprehensive, ACS disability data can help your agency plan a survey and evaluate your survey response rates, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the, in the webinar. So survey data can have the potential to be useful for a lot of different purposes. They're only helpful if you have good data. Bad data can provide an incomplete or incorrect picture of what's going on and lead you to set priorities and policies that may not accurately reflect the needs of the people you serve. Today's webinar will provide some guidelines to help ensure the data your surveys collect are valid and provide accurate and useful information for you and your stakeholders. So 
the survey life cycle. To collect valid data, your survey must be carefully designed, tested, and executed. This and the next slide show the optimal <coughs> steps for conducting a survey study if you had all the time and resources possible. So, of course, in reality, we often don't have all the time and resources possible to, for example, pilot a survey before actual data collection. But when possible, we'd like to go through all these steps because each of them helps ensure the data collected are free of bias and meet our intended needs. The life cycle of a survey consists of planning a survey, conducting focus groups, designing a questionnaire, conducting expert review, cognitive testing of the questionnaire, then programming and laying out the survey in a way that makes it easy for respondents to navigate it and answer questions, pre-testing the survey via a pilot data collection, conducting the main data collection, and finally, analyzing and disseminating your findings. We'll touch on all these steps during the webinar. Now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Pia Veltoa. Hello, everyone. Um, let's talk first about planning a survey. Because the first thing you do when you start conducting a survey is you have to go through this very careful planning process. And it's important to count for key consideration in this early stage of survey development because it can be difficult to change things later in the process. The first step is to clarify the purpose of the survey. For many of you, the ultimate goal of the survey is to provide data that allow your agency to describe rehabilitation needs of individuals with disabilities and to formulate goals and priorities for the development and improvement of the state's vocational rehabilitation services as is required in the comprehensive needs assessment. Whatever the ultimate goal, it is good to start the planning with end in mind to ensure that your survey provides the information you need. You should write a list of the specific things you want to report from your survey data. And then when you start developing the questionnaire, tie each specific piece of information to actual survey questions to ensure that the final questionnaire will be able to provide the information you need. And because many of you need to report the information for different subgroups, such as minorities or individuals with most significant disabilities, it's important to think through at this stage what are the subgroups that you should identify in your survey. Also at this point, it's good to evaluate whether survey is the way to go or if some other data collection better serves your needs. In general, surveys are best for collecting information that can be quantified, i.e. calculated in some way. And because surveys can be quantified, they can be useful to measure change over time, which is a huge benefit of them. And as long as you don't change your measurements, you can you can measure change over time. Other things to consider. Timeline. The timing of the data collection is very important. It's very important to consider. For example, you probably don't want to collect data from VR counselors in late July and August when many people are on vacation. Similarly, you should avoid trying to collect data from businesses during the busy pre-Christmas season. In general, you want to administer the survey when you think people are most likely to have time to respond. The length of the data collection period varies, but typically you want to give respondents at least a month to respond to the survey. Budget. Obviously, you need to match the cost of the survey with your budget. While we seldom have all the money we want to do all what we would like to do, it is important to allocate enough resources so that in the end of the study, you will have all the data that you will be able to use. A bigger budget will, for example, allow you to collect data from more respondents and reach more of the people who are difficult to find and survey. Or also bigger data a bigger budget or it allows you to conduct more analyses that can be helpful for your work. 
And you may be able to save money in the long run if you design your operations and your questions well at the first time. Conducting surveys also take up a lot of staff time and expertise, so you need to evaluate whether your staff has the time and knowledge to conduct the survey or whether you need additional help. As you plan for a survey, one of the big decisions is whether to administer the survey to everyone or only to a sample of individuals. And we will discuss this issue later in the webinar. You also need to decide the mode of your data collection. In other words, whether it makes sense to administer the survey online, on paper, as self-administered, or using an interviewer, etc. Because of the diversity of the population DR surveys are administered to, you likely need multiple survey modes. And in addition to needing more than one mode to data, collect data, you may also need to do it in more than one language. In order to determine what languages besides English might be needed, you could use the American Community Survey to find out what languages are spoken among people with disabilities in different areas of your state. And, of course, it's important to have native speakers to translate the survey questionnaire. The Rehabilitation Services Administration has developed a guide for planning and conducting a survey for the purposes of comprehensive statewide needs assessment. You can find that online, and in our webinar notes, we will provide a web address for that guide. <coughs> let's, let's Next, we will discuss writing survey questions, because the foundation of a survey is the question. Without well-designed questions, all other aspects of the survey don't mean much. So spending enough resources to design good questions and test them is key to collecting high-quality, useful data. Before you can start designing the questionnaire for your survey, you need to consider a few things because they affect how you write questions and answer options and how you lay out your questionnaire. If you need to collect data about a topic that you really don't know enough about to create questions that are meaningful to the respondents, you should start by conducting focus group interviews. And those are guided conversations with small group of people who are similar to the ones you will survey. They are extremely useful in bringing up new information and helping you to understand the issues and appropriate language and the terms that you can use in your questionnaire. The number of participants and the number of focus groups you need varies, but in general, two to three focus group sessions with six to eight participants should be adequate. You should also find out if you can use survey questions that already exist in other surveys, because there's no need to rewrite new survey questions if suitable questions already exist in previously administered surveys. You just need to make sure those questions are of good quality, fit your needs, and there are no restrictions to use them. You can save resources by using these existing questions, because using existing questions can shorten your questionnaire development process, and that's partially because you don't need to test these questions, and testing takes time. Yeah, I have a question. This is Dahlia. How do you find existing survey questions? Well, I was just about oh, to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> there are lots of different ways. but. Um, I have a couple of resources here, and, and federally funded, questions in federally funded surveys are a good place to start with, because those questions have gone through a uh, thorough development process and tend to be a good quality. And since they are public domain, you don't need to worry about getting permissions to use them. 
And also in the appendix of the VR assessment guide I mentioned, um, there is a list of surveys that you might helpful in your work. Also, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has a list of surveys, including the National Health Interview Survey. And we provide a website for that in our uh, webinar notes. And then there is the, uh, then there's the Robert Center for Public Opinion Research, which is one of the world's leading archives of social science data. And that archive is searchable by topic, and the questionnaires can be downloaded for free. So for example, I typed the word disability in the Roper Center's website, and it put up a survey called a survey of employers, survey of employers of people with disabilities and lowering barriers to work. So you might very well find their applicable surveys at the Roper Center website. And that will provide that website for you as well in the uh, webinar notes. So another thing you need to consider is the mode of the data collection, because survey questions and response options are written differently depending on the data collection mode. For example, if you administer your survey by phone, your questions should be shorter and have fewer response options than if you administer it by an, via an interviewer or if it's a self-administered survey. And if your survey is administered using multiple modes, then you need to design the survey so that the same questions work in all, across all the modes. Otherwise, you run the risk of having different modes affect your data. And just as in writing, you want to keep in mind who your reader is. I'm sorry, Pia, yeah, someone asked, I'm sorry to interrupt you, uh, to identify the resource again. Um, if that person, uh, Deborah Collard, if you could um, type in the chat and let us know which resource you're referring to, um, we can um, send it out to everyone through the chat. Yes. Wait, sorry to interrupt. No, that's OK. So let's make sure we, we uh, answer that question. So who is the respondent? You need to keep that in mind. And in general, surveys administered to you as adults if you use high school reading level. In your surveys, you probably want to uh, use low reading level so that your respondents who might have learning or cognitive disabilities will be able to process the questions. So it's very important to keep your uh, survey questions and response options uh, simple. Next, you should consider whether you want to be able to measure change over time. For example, you may want to find out whether the number of Spanish-speaking VR counselors has changed in the past couple of years. If you do, you need to keep your survey questions the same over time. At the same time, you may be able to you may want to be able to change surveys. You you probably want to be able to change your survey questions to meet current needs. So in order to accommodate both goals, you may want to organize your questionnaire so that you have two parts. One is the core, which includes a set of basic questions that remain the same over time. And then you can have these topic modules, which include questions that can be changed as needed. So one part remains the same, and then one or more parts uh, can change over time. Finally, you should keep your questionnaire short, because the longer the survey, the more likely your respondents are to ignore it entirely or only complete it partially. The ideal length of a survey depends on several factors, such as the mode of data collection and your respondents, but in general, web and self-administered surveys should take no more than 15 to 20 minutes to complete. And uh, surveys that are administered to people with disabilities should probably be even shorter than 15 to 20 minutes. We did get, uh, Deborah did respond again. She wanted to know about the website that you just referenced that has archives of surveys available for specific topics. Roper oh, that's, that's Roper Center. It's R-O-P-E-R, -E Roper Center for Public Opinion Research. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Deborah. So if Thank you, you Google Deborah. Roper Center, it will come up. Great. Thank you. Great. Okay. More about writing survey questions. This slide shows 10 basic guidelines for writing questions and response options that help ensure that your data are valid, which means that uh, your questions measure what they are intended to measure. And there are many, many more rules for how to write and lay out your questionnaire to obtain valid data, but obviously today we have time only for a couple of these uh, guidelines. Here's a question. Be your staff, this is from an existing uh, uh, questionnaire, or it's a statement, I guess, in more in a statement form. Be your staff was courteous and helpful on an ongoing basis throughout the time I had an open case. This is presented to a respondent. What do you think is wrong with this statement type of question? If you could send your responses using the chat function. So what do you think is wrong? Oh. Um, uh, just to remind everyone, you have to switch your little drop-down box to respond to all participants, and then everyone can see your chat. Thanks, so if you were the respondent, how would you answer this question if you thought that the VR staff was curious but not helpful? And we'll give everyone about 20 or 30 seconds to form your response. And again, enter it in the chat, responding to all attendees. Hmm. Asking too much information in one question, multiple areas. Another one says it's too vague. Some have good days and some have bad. Great. What else? This is a two-tailed or more question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is um, what survey methodologists call the double-barrel question. Because there is no way to answer this question if you don't think that the VR staff was both courteous and helpful. So this type of situation mm -hmm. where you have, where one question includes multiple questions is very frequent problem in surveys. And it is difficult, it's a problem because it's difficult to interpret the meaning of the data from these type of questions because you really don't know which question the respondent answers since you ask more than one. Another concern is that you may end up with a very low item response rate because some respondents skip items like this, and they tend to skip items like this because they can't answer it. So the way to fix this type of question is to split it up and ask it in, in this case, in two questions. The staff was courteous on an ongoing basis, and then the other one was the staff was helpful. Here's another one. What's wrong with this one? In the past month, has your health limited your ability to do vigorous activities such as jogging, swimming, or biking? Again, if you would chat with us about what you think is problematic about this question. And again, you'll want to enter your responses in the chat feature uh, and send it to all participants. Some folks are using the Q&A, and that's fine. We'll read that out loud. But if you type it into the chat feature, everyone will be able to see it. And uh, Linda has said, those are not the only activities that are vigorous. Very good. Yeah, and that's the problem or the issue always when you have examples. Which ones do you include? But that examples can steer people's um, recall in a certain way or consideration. But what I, one thing that's uh, problematic with this question is, is that it has a hidden contingency. 
it applies only to a subset of respondents. But if you think about it, what does the no answer to this question mean? It can mean two totally different things. Either that a person's health has limited his or her ability to do vigorous activities, such as jogging, swimming, or biking, or that a person doesn't normally do vigorous activities, and in that situation, health has nothing to do with the no answer. So, so as a result, you would not know how to interpret the no answers to this question. And um, one way to revise this question would be to ascertain first whether the person normally does vigorous activities and then follow up with a question like this. So after the questionnaire has been designed, the validity of the questions and response of them needs to be tested. You can do that via expert reviews, cognitive interviews, and pilot administration of the survey. Expert reviews should be done first. And experts are any individuals who have deep knowledge of the survey topic, and, and they should review your surveys and provide substantive comments about the questions. In addition to reviewing the items or the survey questions from content perspective, you should use experts who can, people who are experts in questionnaire writing review or writing um, guidelines. These experts ensure that the way your questions and response options have been written follow best practices based on empirical studies. And ideally, you have employed questionnaire writing experts from the very beginning of your questionnaire development. But if you have not, uh, it's a good idea to involve them at this uh, expert review stage. After the expert review, it's time to test the surveys in cognitive interviews. These are one-on-one -on -one sessions with an interviewer and a respondent who has volunteered to participate in the cognitive interviews. And with these interviews, it's very important that your participants are similar to the participants of the actual survey. So if you're testing a um, VR customer survey that will be administered to VR customers with various disabilities, then you need to find cognitive interview participant with similar disabilities. In, in cognitive interviews, the participants are instructed to think aloud while they go through their, or he, because it's one-on-one, -on -one, so the participant is instructed to think aloud while he or she goes through the survey answering questions. And listening to respondents to think aloud while they answer questions and observing their body language, it's very useful in detecting any problems that might, or most of the problems that might exist with the validity of the uh, data that you might get. During the interview, the interviewer usually follows a pre-written protocol which prompts the interviewer to ask the participants to explain certain terms, for example. And um, in general, cognitive interviews can reveal issues related to um, comprehension of the meaning of the questions, ability to recall answers, lack of knowledge to provide responses, how sensitive the question topics are, and adequacy of the response options that you have to find. So minimally, Cognitive interviews require only a quiet place and tape recorder. You don't need any fancy facilities. And it's not necessary to have a large group of participants either. As few as 5 to 15 participants might be enough to detect the most severe problems with your survey questions. And with regard to these uh, cognitive interviews, the National Center for Health Statistics sponsors a website called Q Bank, so letter Q and B A N G Bank, Q Bank, which has many resources related to survey question evaluation, and the Q Bank collects surveys and the their cognitive interview studies from federal agencies and research organizations. 
And on that website, you can search questions by topic, survey name, or keywords. So this website that we will provide you its um, web address with the notes can have a great resource for not only finding survey questions, but also finding out how they perform in the cognitive interview. And then the third method to test your survey is the pilot. Pilot administration is just like a real survey administration, except that you have a small number of participants. And the reason why you do a pilot survey is that you can use the data from the pilot survey to evaluate whether your survey questions are behaving as they were expected to behave, or whether they should be revised or dropped. And in addition to testing your survey question, pilots also allow you to practice your field operations so that you can discover any problems at this point and fix them before their real data collection. And you know, pilots do add costs to your study, but they can also save money by helping you to prevent problems during the data collection time and ensuring that you end up with valid and usable data. Um, next, we are going to talk about data collection. Um, I'm going to turn the mic to Mark. Thanks, Pia. So once you've developed all the questions, done all your planning, it's time to actually collect the data. So first thing I want to address, you've probably heard the term, we've certainly used it in the webinar today, is mode. What is mode? Mode is the way you collect the data. It's really based around three things. How you contact respondents, for example, in person, by telephone, by mail or email. How you administer the questions so with an interviewer or if the respondent is answering themselves or self-administered, and how you collect the data, so on paper versus some kind of uh, automated system. And so surveys can be a single mode, or they can be collected through a combination of these modes. That's known as multi-mode or mixed mode. And as Pia mentioned earlier, that's a very common way to do surveys uh, nowadays. So how do you choose a mode? It's one of the key decisions you must make during the design period. Every mode has advantages and disadvantages. I'm going to give you a few examples of each. Telephone and in-person surveys tend to be more expensive than self-administered surveys. This is because interviews on the telephone or in-person require you to pay a person to interview respondents. Also, um, telephone surveys are, are more expensive because cell phones are uh, commonly replacing landline phones, so your response rates for telephone surveys are much lower. Therefore, you're getting less bang for your buck, so to speak. <clears throat> Mark, could you explain why a cell phone user would be harder to reach than a landline user? Sure, it's a great question. So, and you know, currently it's, tip it's it's a lot easier to get a list of cell phone numbers. Or, I mean, excuse me, of landline numbers uh, with you know with associated um, Data, and you can use random digit dialing to, to call people that you know live in a certain area, things like your cell phone, since the number isn't tied to a location and it's also harder to get a list of them, they're, they're just simply less effective. Also, there's do not call lists uh, nowadays that you know, preclude you from contacting certain people. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So self-administered surveys like paper and pencil and web-based surveys have advantages like cost, but you do have to rely on the respondent to be able to complete the interview alone. It means you have to consider literacy, so your pre-testing protocol should specifically address these concerns, including language barriers. Directions must be clear to eliminate respondent confusion. There's no interviewer to provide clarity or answer questions like there is on a telephone or in-person survey. Ultimately, your decision comes down to a variety of factors, including the target population, that is, who will be surveyed? For example, a survey of individuals aged 65 and over would probably be less likely to respond to a web-based survey invitation. How complicated is the survey? Surveys with complex routing are better for interviewer-based surveys to reduce errors and the burden associated with the respondent following the routing logic. 
So with a interviewer-based survey, they simply ask the respondents the questions in order, and the respondents are required to look through a paper form to find out where they need to go next, things like that. What type of questions will be asked? If a survey has lengthy or complicated questions, a self-administered mode allows respondents to read the text multiple times without having to ask a question to be repeated. Uh, when will the survey be conducted? Web surveys, typically quicker turnaround time than interviewer-administered surveys it's because you can do a lot of your data processing uh, automatically. Since the person is entering it into the computer, you, you don't have to process paper forms things of that nature. And finally, and probably most important, what budget and resources are available? Self-administered surveys cost much less than interviewer surveys, which, as mentioned before, have much higher overhead and labor costs. So I want to touch briefly on a specific example or specific theme that may be relevant to, the, to you all in particular, which is hard to survey populations. So most surveys are typically designed for people in reasonably good health with intellectual abilities in the normal range without serious sensory impairments. But the problem is that those outside of this range represent, often represent the population you all are trying to reach. So how can we more effectively survey these individuals? First of all, this reinforces the need for thoughtful questionnaire design that Pia talked about a little bit earlier. Expert reviews and cognitive interviews can provide excellent insight into whether questions or the manner in which they are presented is problematic for respondents. As with all surveys, the best solution depends on the goals and budget of the survey. However, here's a few tips. Plan accordingly. Know the population and what your difficulties will be in advance so that you don't have to make adjustments on the fly later on. Where possible, use interviewer-administered surveys, either in your telephone or in person. Interviewers can be trained to accommodate individuals during, during data collection. So that's particularly important if it's a, it's a hard to survey population. Finally, use the proper survey tools. So uh, nowadays, many survey platforms are designed to be 508 and TTY compliant. So these systems are designed to improve accessibility and are incredibly useful, and, and they're not much more expensive than, than other platforms. So it's, it's incredibly important to be aware of the tools out there and, and how they can, can, can help you. Okay. Frame and sample. So Pia mentioned earlier the notion of a sample or universe survey. And although sometimes it's possible to survey all members of a population, which is a universe survey, in most cases that's difficult and impractical. So we can use sample surveys to collect data from a subset of the population that's generalizable to the population as a whole. The key feature of sample surveys is that they significantly reduce cost while still allowing you to collect useful data. So to do a sampling survey or sample survey, you need what we call a sampling frame. A sampling frame is a list of the units or people that form a population from which a sample is taken. It's uh, very important when you're planning a survey to consider what you might be able to use as a possible sampling frame. And ideally, the sampling frame contains all members of a population and how to contact them. So, it's important to know that sampling frames are sort of a complicated concept, and it's okay if you don't fully digest it right away. The main takeaway here is to understand that the more information you have about your population before you conduct a survey, the easier it is to collect useful data. Sorry, sorry about that. So, as is often the case, uh, especially for, for you, I'm sure, and, and for lots of surveys, what do you do? when you don't have a sampling frame. So in, in many cases, there's, there's no sampling frame to draw a sample from. This is especially true when the population of interest has a low prevalence among the general population. So one thing you can do is use secondary data sources to, to target data collection efforts in areas where the population of interest is more likely to be located. 
sources like the American Community Survey can can provide data on where your target population might be concentrated. So the, the American Community Survey has data by block group and, and track level, so you can get a very uh, close-in view you know, geographically of where you know a population of interest might be. <clears throat> There's also other approaches you can take that don't rely on other sampling approaches that don't require a sampling frame. What I'm going to talk about now is snowball sampling, which has a funny name but can be very useful. Snowball sampling refers to asking survey respondents to provide contact information for individuals they know who are part of the population of interest. So you're essentially using your respondents to give you more respondents, hence the snowball. It's typically done by including a survey item, often at the end of the survey, where the respondent is asked about other individuals who might be eligible for the survey. Snowball sampling is a great tool for increasing the sample size, but the trade-off is that it, it can increase bias. This is because respondents will generally provide information about other individuals who are similar to them. When we're doing a survey, we want our sample to represent all the subgroups that comprise our population. So that's, that's something you have to think about when doing snow loss sampling. Sometimes you don't have a choice and you'd like to, to survey a certain number of people, but you just have to be aware that uh, that type of sampling is going to generate uh, data that, that may be that may be biased. Okay, response rates. This is often considered the defining indicator of success of a survey. So, so what do we mean response rate? Response rate is the percentage of people who completed and returned the survey question out of the total number of surveys eligible to be completed. It is a measure of the level of success or the quality achieved in collecting survey data. So how do you calculate them? There are different methods, but the main idea remains the same no matter how you do the math. It says on the slide, a response rate is calculated by dividing the number of completed surveys by the total number of surveys distrib distributed or the total number of surveys intended to be completed. So the key, one of the key terms there is eligibility. And how we define eligibility depends on the nature of the survey. In some cases, everybody who we try to survey is eligible. In other surveys, it may be different. For example, in a male-based household survey, we usually considered unoccupied or vacant houses ineligible. And so these houses wouldn't count during the calculation of a response rate. So, why are response rates important? Response rates are one way to gauge whether your survey results are representative. A high response rate maximizes the chance the results you collected are representative of the target population. A low response rate increases the chance of biased results, which cannot be generalized to the population of interest. Another benefit of response rate what we call face validity, is that they're easy to explain and understand when you're presenting the results of your survey. People are more likely to accept that the data you collected is representative and useful if the response rate is higher. So do a quick little poll. Uh, we give you some options, but if you have any other ideas, please feel free to enter them in the, check, uh, the text, uh, chat box. Excuse me. Um, what is the ideal response rate? 100%, 80%, 51%. Is somebody saying A? Yeah. 100%. Of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for the answers. I actually, I, I tricked you. Um, there's no right answer. As is the case with many aspects of surveys, it depends. Your target response rate will always depend on the factors we've discussed so far in the webinar. The main factors are mode, budget, and the target population. So for example, online surveys are much, much less expensive to, to conduct than a face-to-face -face interviewer, but they have much lower response rates. There's a direct relationship between the amount of time, money, and effort you invest in a survey 
and the response rate. It's important you keep this in mind when you're setting goals for your survey during the planning process. So, um, Mark, um, it, it depends, but isn't there some basic number at which you'd want to have more than that in order to be able to say something about the population? For example, if you had a less than 50% response rate, would that be uh, a valid response rate in any case? So that's a great question. And yes, it could be. And what's also important in addition to response rate, which we have touched on in a moment, is the, the presence of bias in your estimates. So for example, if you had a 40% response rate that happened to very closely resemble your overall population, you would actually not be, you'd probably be better off than a survey with a 75% response rate where you only, only really one type of person, you know, one type of respondent answered. So, you know, there's, there's, no, there's no magic number. Um, you, know, some, you know, some surveys, some federally administered surveys require over 50% to report results. Others require special analyses if it's below 80%. That said, it, it really it really depends. If you're if you're doing face to face interview or interviews, you should expect to be you know above fifty. But if you're doing a, a simple web survey, you know you're, you're probably not going to be able to get that. It's important to to know how you're going to be able to use that data regardless. Okay, thank you. And whenever you can, you should try to evaluate whether your respondents represent the people you think they are representing. Mm -hmm. So whether, no matter what your response rates are, if they're 100%, then you're good. You don't have to do additional analysis. But if you don't have that, you should try to, if you have any information about, like ACS data, American Community Survey data, again, are you going to talk about that, Mark? Sure. Okay. I so am. Why don't you, why don't, yeah, why don't but you first, go ahead. first, let's talk about okay. um, next slide. Steps to maximize response rates. And as you see, we have people cheering happily. <laughs> here, um, so there's there's a couple of tactics anybody can use to to boost the response rate. It's just a little bit or maybe a lot, depending. So, first one, be positive. Generate po positive publicity for your survey. Phrase your materials in a very you know a positive, uh, uplifting way. So two is ask instead of tell, which means you're appealing to people's helping tendencies. Rather than tell them how their, you know, their response will help or that they need to respond, you ask them to help. Next is uh, make the survey topic salient. So ensure that the respondents see the value of their survey and their responses and point out their personal connection to the topic. <clears throat> Next is be clear. Obviously, provide clear instructions on how to complete and submit the surveys. I've seen many surveys where this "be clear" guideline was was violated, and some um, and somebody the instructions for for how to log in or how to respond were completely uh, difficult, and, and responses will just will just give up. They'll just forget about it. So you want it you want it to be really easy for them. Um, which leads to the next one. Make it easy um, and make it attractive. Make the questionnaire look good. A lot of research and, and survey methods recently is focused on visual design and and how to arrange pages on the on the web or on paper in a way that's visually appealing. This has been proven to to improve response rates. So rather than have a sort of blank piece of paper with questions and response options, you can you can use you know, design techniques that are common and throughout advertising and other publishing to make the survey look good. And that'll help. The next, what do you do if your response rate is low? And this gets at uh, the question, you know, the discussion we had a moment ago, which is that sometimes the response rate is lower than we hoped, lower than we expected. Of course, this is disappointing, but there are some steps we should take in these situations. First of all, be transparent. Include your response rate, even when it's low, in reporting or presenting results. It's better that you, you do this up front because it will allow others to form their own interpretation and improve your credibility in the event that, you know, you don't if you don't put it out there up front, there are people are going to learn 
of it, and then it makes it cast down on, on all your data. So you, you be transparent. Next, you can use a technique known as benchmarking, which is what Pia was alluding to earlier. So you can measure, um, this is an alternative measure to response rate, and it refers to comparing your survey results to another known data source. For example, you can compare the demographics of your survey respondents with uh, those on the American Community Survey in the same geographic area. If your respondents resemble the overall population, then your results are still very useful despite a low response rate. That's because they're representative. In fact, as I said earlier, many researchers would prefer a representative respondent pool to simply a high response rate. And this is another sort of newer idea in survey research which is that, you know, it's not necessarily the number of people who answer your survey, it's the fact that they, they resemble the group of people who you, who you want them to resemble. So, Great. thank um, you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Pia. Um, we did have um, some questions come through earlier on during the presentation. We now have um, about five minutes left in the webinar. I wanted to ask, um, Everyone on the phone, please, if you have any questions for Mark or Pia, they're very knowledgeable, feel free to enter them into the Q&A section or the chat function. You can submit your question to all participants, um, and we'll uh, respond to your questions. And while we're waiting for folks to respond to their questions, would you go to the next slide, Claire? Um, I just wanted to mention to folks that we do have um, future uh, webinars. This is the second, as I mentioned, in the series. The first webinar um, was on data use, and we had two VR agencies speak about how they use data um, at the state level for a variety of purposes. And that webinar is available on the AIR website. Um, you can go back and uh, watch that webinar or listen to it if you haven't already. Complete an evaluation form, and we are providing CEUs for that as well as today's webinar. Uh, we only ask that you complete the evaluation form in order to receive the CEU. Um, we will have future topics, uh, future webinars on topics like VR competencies, assistive technology, and outreach to the business community. Uh, we're planning the next one for the summer, and that will be on program evaluation. Um, we really encourage you to contact us with any ideas you have for future webinars, or future webinar topics that are relevant to state VR administration. Um, and we'll continue to watch the chat and the QA um, uh, portions uh, on the right of the webinar in case anyone has questions. We have a question from Sue asking, when benchmarking, you said compare your results or respondents to a known what? I lost the word or concept. So, so a known population. <laughs> so for example, if, if you, you can look at you can look at your survey respondents by, by demographic characteristics like age and gender, um, and, and uh, you can look at those on the American Community Survey, for example, the same breakdown. So if, you're, if your respondents have a similar distribution, we'll say a similar uh, average age and similar proportion male and female as what's on the American Community Survey data, you know that your, your group, your group of respondents resembles that of the actual population in the, in the area that you're looking for. So, so I think the, the word or concept was population. And uh, someone else asked if it's possible, oh great, Sue got it, Sue got it, thanks. Great. And someone else asked if it's possible to get a PDF of the webinar slides. Yes, absolutely, we can send those out to uh, folks who participated in today's webinar. Uh, thank you for asking that question. We will also post the recorded webinar on the AIR website, um, so you can uh, watch or listen to the webinar at another time and share it with your colleagues if you found it useful. And we hope you did. Um, please let us know through your evaluation, which we'll send out to you. We'll send a link to you in the next few days to complete the evaluation form. We are now at the top of the hour, so thank you again, Mark and Pia, for joining us and providing such an informative uh, presentation. And thank you all. Um, uh, participants for uh, attending, and uh, again, let us know if you have any other ideas. Mark and Pia's contact information is on the slide on the screen in front of you. Feel free to contact them directly if you have any more questions. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.